thrilled to be in this room with me right now. You can turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Somebody say, fire him up, Lord. Fire him up, Lord. Whew, help me, Jesus, today. How many have enjoyed this series that we've been in for three months? Three months of getting in a pulpit and trying to inspire people to be driven in the things of Jesus Christ. Putting your priorities to the side and making Jesus your number one priority. Right. Being driven and led by your spirit that should ignite with the Holy Spirit as you are saved and on your way to heaven. Not being driven by your flesh, not being driven by your agenda, not being a, a driven by your want-tos and need-tos, but what God wants for your life. I don't know about y'all, but we have had a great, great time, and this is going to be our last message, and then we'll We'll have more of it to say Tuesday night. And then we'll start preparing for a new series for the Christmas season. And then another one for the, the beginning of the year. But we've been in a series called, what's it been called? Yes. Driven. And as we wind down this life-changing motivational study concerning the drive and determination of our human spirit igniting and aligning with the Holy Spirit that has been our mission to ensure that you receive fully from God all, somebody shout all, all, that is intended for you and not just through fiery anthem-like messages. That's the way we started out. But then we shifted into studies like this one today that deal with the deficits, depletions, the missed marks, and the op missed opportunities that befall upon many lives and cause us not to fully receive. In order to fully receive, what God gives a preacher from the pulpit, you have to adjust your thinking. If you're sitting there right now thinking I'm about to hear the Sunday morning sermon, I've got to do this when I get home. It's time to get out the Christmas decor this afternoon. There's some incredible football being played on television today. Everybody's on TV today. Cowboys, Patriots, Pat oh. I'm going to go eat this buffet. I'm going to go do this. If you're thinking of those things, i got some bad news for you. You're not going to receive what God has put here for you to have. And the problem is, I would love to know that every single person in here is going to get it. But Jesus said a long time ago, when you get it, one out of four get it. Somebody let your neighbor and say, I'm going to be that one. I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to be that number two, number three, number four. I'm going to be that one that gets it. Amen? Yeah. So what's getting ready to happen is I'm about to throw some seed out there. Amen? Yeah. Does everybody want to just do like this right here? <laughs> just do like that. Here we go. Let's look at it. Driven. Somebody shout driven. Yeah. Where we are in this portion of Scripture. We have the familiar account of where Jesus visits this beloved family whose house he had frequented several times. Mary and Martha were Lazarus' sisters. And Jesus was very close to this family. This passage of Scripture, in which uh, the way it is worded, it sounds like perhaps it could be one of the first times or the first time that he had ever visited their home. Let's look at verse 38 in Luke chapter 10. It says, now it happened as they, who's they? Jesus and his disciples. As they went, that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted. Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing one thing, this one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not, which will not, good God Almighty, I'm thankful that it will not be taken away from her. Is anybody ready to break this down and receive? 
receive a blessing from the throne of, throne of grace. You better let heaven hear you right now. And you better clarify and declare in your spirit that nothing, absolutely nothing is going to get in the way of you receiving fully what the Lord wants you to have today. Father, in Jesus' name, we praise you. We love you. We adore you. We look to you for all things. We thank you for the time of praise and worship. But God, now our hearts are ready. Our hearts are ready to receive fully what it is you want to give us today. May we receive it fully in Jesus' holy name. Somebody say amen. 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 Hallelujah. This final Driven Series message is called Driven Past Destiny. Somebody say it with me. Driven past destiny. You know, before, and this is probably pre-GPS era, have you ever been so excited to get somewhere that you drove right past it? <laughs> this morning? <laughs> Amen. You were so excited, you were so honed in, and even with the GPS, you know, the lady's voice can be on there, and you can be listening, you can drive right. She might take you out, all out in the middle of nowhere, and, you know, you, you're so excited, you go right past where you're supposed to be. Amen? You know, not only can that happen with actual geographical locations and des destinations, but it can also happen concerning incredible moments of opportunity as well. Right? You're too busy to go out there and throw that football. You're too distracted to sit down and have a tea party with your daughter. But in life, a lot of times, even if, when it doesn't come to those sentimental things, we can have good intentions, but not do things the right way. There's a term called headstrong. And before I get into it, when, let's go back to GPS for a moment. When you have GPS speaking to you through your cell phone, or if you still use the, the Jarman box, uh, you know, what did we do before that? Kids, let me, let me talk. We had MapQuest, and you would go on the internet, and you would print the directions, and then you would have it laying on the front seat, and you would reach over to flip it over, or have your spouse hold it for you. And before that, you had actual big maps. That was a long time ago, kids. I remember Daddy pulling out the big map and pulling off on the side of the road to get where we were going because we wanted to get there and we didn't want to go past it. We didn't want to miss where we were supposed to be going. But when the GPS, when you, don't, when you end up going past it, there's a problem. Maybe you get to talking too loud. Maybe you turned some music up and you didn't hear the GPS tell you you needed to take that exit. See, if you're not listening clearly to what you're being led by, you won't get to where you're being led to. And so we've got to hone in on the right voice that's telling us where we're wanting to go. Right? Hallelujah. Because there are so many things that can distract us. And maybe it's not always something else. Maybe it's us. What can cause us to miss things? There's a term called headstrong. Somebody say headstrong. Headstrong. Which means a person is very determined, which is good. But they're so focused on their own way of doing things that they actually get in their own way of doing those things. We can get driven and we can get focused and we can get determined. But if we don't allow our heart to catch up with and surpass our head, then we'll miss vital things in life. Can I go ahead and give you a shout point this morning? Give me shout point number one. We have plenty of headstrong Christians when what we need is more heartstrong Christians. I didn't come this morning to preach to your head. I came to preach to your heart. Amen? Your heart Today. Amen. If it only gets in your head, you'll think of every worldly secular reason for why this can't be possible. And you will get to the point that you don't believe half of what the Bible says. Well, how can a man be 
swallowed by a fish and live? Amen. How can a man in ancient times build a boat that big? To how can a man walk on water? And die on a cross three days later and rise again. I mean, if you go there, you'll, you'll get out there. I've seen people come through this church over the last 11 years and their head got it, but their heart didn't get it. And guess what? They talked themselves right out of what they believe and now they don't believe nothing and they're not anywhere believing anything. They're not reading the Bible. They're reading every mystical book of mystical power and everything that they've allowed to be put in front of God. If you don't make Jesus your chief cornerstone and you don't let things get into your heart and only get into your head, Changes your mind at times. But once it gets down in your heart, my God, it'll stick. Somebody say, get it in my heart, God. Oh, I gotta calm down so we can go here. Head strong. We need heart strong instead of head strong. Amen. Now it doesn't mean if you're head strong that you don't love, that you don't feel, that you don't have compassion. But it does mean that you do, in fact, allow yourself to be driven and led differently than you should, right? right? Such was the case with Martha in our earlier text. Can we return to that in Luke 10? Here is a good example of meaning well, but missing the importance of the moment at hand. Right. A lot of people mean well, but they miss the importance of the moment at hand. Jesus comes to her house and it says that Martha and they all welcomed her, welcomed him in. But then Mary sat at his feet and heard his word. I want you to listen to that verse right there. Have you ever just gone past it and you just imagine Mary just sitting there all giddy like this, like a fan of Jesus? I see it deeper than that. She's sitting at his feet in his presence, hearing his word. Amen. Is that not where we are supposed to be? Yes. Is everybody with me this morning? You're awake this morning? Yes. We are supposed to be at the feet of Jesus, humbling ourselves so that we may decrease so that he can increase and want to be in his presence. A lot of times the reasons people don't deeply get the things of God or know who they are is they've been stuck in church religion for so many years and they've been following this pastor and that pastor and this preacher and that preacher and they as a Christian have never ever bothered to get in the presence of Jesus Christ. They've been told it's weird. It looks weird. It sounds weird. I used to be scared to death of Pentecostal style worship. Coming to church, somebody was shouting, I stayed out in the line. When they're done, I'll go back in. They done fell on the floor. Somebody caught 911. They're speaking in another language in there. What in the world? Where am I at? Uncomfortable, did not like it, did not want nothing to do with it. Then I got saved. Then I came to the altar. Then God gave me a vision. Then somebody preached and laid hands on me. And I felt like a grizzly bear had thrown me down very comfortably to the floor. And I felt the radiating power of the Holy Ghost come over me. I spoke in other tongues and my life has never been the same ever since. I mean, there's more to it than that, but I don't have a whole lot of time to tell you. And I, it's, I've never been the same ever since. And I, I love uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus in worship. Yes. And you might think this is odd to say, but God showed me a vision of Jesus' feet when I was, right after I got saved. I saw his feet in a vision standing right here. But the light was so bright right here, I could not see past. But I saw the holes in his feet and, and the bronze color of his feet that the book of Revelation said. I saw that early on as a Christian. Amen. And I thank God for taking me there. I thank God for showing me supernatural things like that. Amen. Especially before I got so bogged down and bombarded and busy with being a pastor. Amen. I have to remind myself, I've got to go back to where I started. I cannot.
cannot forsake my prayer calls. I cannot forsake fasting. I cannot forsake praising. Amen. It can't just be business as usual and administrative decisions all the time. I've got to be a worshiper if I expect you to worship me. She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. What does the Bible say about hearing his word? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So what was she doing? She was worshiping in his presence and her faith was being increased every, second by second by every word that has proceeded out of his mind. Right? She saw a moment. She saw the importance of that moment and she did what she was supposed to do in that moment. She reacted. But we have two sisters here living in the same house. One sitting at the feet of Jesus worshiping Having her faith increased, the other one's in the kitchen working, distracted. One's worshiping, one's distracted. That is the church. In this room right now, there are worshipers and there are people who are distracted. You are distracted by every kind of thing. You're distracted by what you're looking at on your phone right now instead of listening to me. You're, you're distracted by the, the person in front of you, and you might have to slide up. You're 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 distracted on on, on what a good-looking guy teammate is here. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> you're distracted by all kinds of things, and it's easy to get distracted. But you got to decide not to stay distracted. You gotta be able to say, devil, you're not taking this moment from me. You're not robbing me of this moment to worship my God. You're not robbing me of this moment to tell my spouse what they truly mean to me. You're not robbing me of this moment to spend some quality time with my child. Whatever vital moment you're approached with, Mary saw the moment and she seized the moment. But Martha was distracted with much serving. She meant well. But she was missing the importance of the moment at hand. Amen? So what does she do? What does she do? She approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care? Don't you care what's going on here? Can I tell you, a lot of times, people who are distracted by the wrong things in ministry will blame the leader for not seeing what they're going through. Do you not see what I'm going through? Do you not see that I'm the only one in here that's working? Do you not see that I'm the only one in here who cares enough? That I'm in here doing everything and she's not helping me? There's nothing wrong with serving. We've got to have people serving. One is worshiping, the other is serving. Do you know that while we're worshiping today, there are people serving so you can worship? While you're worshiping, they got people at the door. While we get ready to pray, there are men in here who've been asked, you can't close your eyes when it's time to pray. You've got to keep your eyes on this room. Because in the day we live in, we've got to have a safe, secure church. There are people over there watching your babies and your grandbabies so you can be in here. There are people over there working in children's church so that they're not in here with you saying, Mama, i got to go to the bathroom ten times. People are serving. So for every children's church worker, every nursery worker, every greeter, every usher, please always let them know how much you appreciate what they do so you can worship. And as we grow, there'll be more and more and more of them. We need worshipers in the church and we need servers. But can I tell you, there's always a time. There's a time to serve and there's a time to worship. Let me say that again. There's a time to serve and a time to worship. And when you're doing what God has called you to do, you cannot be worried about who's not doing what they're supposed to do. Jesus even gave a parable one time about the workers that came in at the last hour of the day. And people were complaining because they hadn't worked as long. He said, oh, what I pay them is putting me and them. You worry about what you're doing. She says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, watch this now. She gets uppity with Jesus. This is her talking to Jesus now. Therefore, tell her to help me. Tell her to help me. I can 
could go, I could go in so many different directions. <laughs> but I want to stay safe today. <laughs> and I want all my brothers out there to stay safe today. <laughs> I want you to make it through Thanksgiving, brothers. So we're going to move on, okay? Tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, when Jesus says your name twice, you better check yourself. <laughs> Martha, Martha, Simon, Simon, verily, verily. It's all that 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 twice thing there, it leads to a covenant. Amen. You're not in trouble, you're just being corrected. Because you're in covenant, right? It's kind of like growing up, if my mama said, Daniel, I'm like, okay, yeah, mom. But if she said, Daniel Parker. I was looking for a place to hide. You see the difference? He didn't say Martha. He said Martha, Martha. In other words, Sandy Cross talk, if we were to put something else in the place there, we would say, bless your heart. Bless your heart, girl. You're missing it. You're missing the point. You ever try to talk some, to somebody about something and they were just totally missing the point and no matter what you had to say and no matter what you tried to do, they just missed the point and finally you just said, it's all right. It's okay. Bless your heart. It's all right. Don't even worry about it. It don't even matter no more. Don't, don't even worry about it no more. Amen? Hallelujah. Am I being leaned up here? I'm sorry. Come on. Has anybody ever not had those conversations? I don't keep on and on and on. If we've done talking about it five times and it's still not getting across, I just say, God bless you. <laughs> you can't change everybody's mind. They're going to believe what they're going to believe. If they want to believe in something wrong, I can't help that. If I've tried to... All right, here we go. Martha, Martha. He says, you are worried and troubled about many things. That's where she's at. You got one house. Jesus is in the house. You got two sisters. One's worshiping. The other one's distracted. One is sitting at his feet. The other one is uh, serving in the kitchen. One is hearing his word and being increased with her faith. The other one is so distracted and worried about so many things. Can I tell you the enemy wants you to worry about everything in the world right now except what you're supposed to be focused on? The enemy don't want you to enjoy church this morning. He doesn't want you to enjoy a sermon. He doesn't want you to enjoy Thanksgiving. He'd rather bog you down on how you got to clean the curtains and you got to mop the floor and you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to get this done before everybody comes over. And by the time Thanksgiving's here, you're so worn out, you can't even think to enjoy yourself. Can I tell you, every person in here, enjoy your holiday this week. Enjoy seeing people you've not seen in a long time. Because there's people in here right now, they've had a lot of people in their family pass away. They tell you right now, don't get so bombarded thinking about this and that. Enjoy it. If you are blessed to have your grandparents with you this year, you need to really enjoy that. If you're blessed to still have your mama and your daddy, you need to enjoy mama and daddy. Amen? Am I talking right? Come on, somebody. Don't worry yourself to death about all the other things. Jesus said, he said, one thing's needed right now. Nothing wrong with serving. We can do that afterwards. He said, one thing is needed right now. And Mary chose that. And I'm not taking it away from her. I'm not taking this away from her. I'm not telling Mary, uh, because you're trying to get me to do what you want me to do. And you're trying to back me in a corner and say, this is how we're supposed to do it. And if we don't do it we're not, this way, we're not doing it right. Uh -uh. I'm not taking this away from her. Amen? Come on, somebody. You might be in a hurry today, but I am not going to rush through this thing and miss vital points that people's lives in this place are in here today. Come on, somebody. Those that are really here to receive a blessing, it shall not be taken away from you. You know, this reminds me too, and bear with me on this, this reminds me of the zeal 
of new believers. People who just got saved. They can be this way, causing them to harshly judge. They're easily disappointed and offended. Help me out. I've seen people get saved. Glory to God. Get baptized, join the church, start working. Then all of a sudden they develop this law-bound mentality. And they'll want to tell you all about it. I know, bro. Man. I, I do everything at my church. Won't nobody do nothing. They're just sitting around waiting for this, waiting for that. They're just so doggone late. I tell you what, the church didn't have me. I don't know what they do. <laughs> Man, I read my Bible 15 times a day. I have fasted for a year. My God, I went fishing, got out of the boat, and I walked across the pond. Disappointment, and guess what? A year later, they're not even in church doing nothing no more. They're sitting in the house saying, I don't need you Christian. There's a bunch of hypocrites down there. Guess what? There's a bunch of hypocrites working at Walmart, but I bet you don't still go there every week. There's a bunch of hypocrites down there in the plant you work at. But you still don't get that check. Amen. Pastor, do you want hypocrites in your church? push you away he's testing you with that I believe that Mary had no problems going in that kitchen and serving Jesus something but it won't time right. you see servers should also be worshipers That's right. amen. Amen? amen don't forsake being a worshiper just cause you're serving don't stop serving Martha meant well, but she was missing the meaning of the moment at hand. Can I give you shout point number two? We can mean well and still miss the real meaning. You can mean well, but still miss the purpose, still miss the main point. You look, the, the, I, I've heard it said, was it an old saying you say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Am I correct on that? People that have good intentions mean well. There are people out there that are actively committed to sin, actively committed to an abominable lifestyle, actively committed to, I don't need to pray, I don't need to ask Jesus into my heart, I'm a good enough person. And they do incredible things for people. They're a good neighbor. They help people. They do incredible things. That has godly qualities and Christian values. But can I tell you, they mean well, but they've missed the meaning. Because going to heaven, you don't get there by doing good things for your neighbor. You don't go there because you're a nice person that's never done anybody wrong. You get there when Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life. That is it. There is no other way to heaven. There's no other religion. There's no other belief. Amen. Pastor, what do you say to this person and that person? No matter who they are when they come into this church, everybody's welcome no matter how they're living or what they're doing. Let me say that again. Everyone is welcome no matter how they're living or what they are doing. But I said it in the same thing Jesus said. Go and sin. No more. That's right. 
Who's welcome in your church? Everybody. Are Muslims welcome in your church? Yes. Are Buddhists welcome in your church? Yes. Homosexuals welcome in your church? Yes. And so are fornicators, adulterers, liars, thieves. Hateful people, jerks. <laughs> Come on, they're all welcome. They're all welcome. Amen. And guess what? I love them. Jesus loves them. Go and sin no more. Where do you stand on all that? The same place Jesus stands. Go and sin no more. What do they do? Are they still welcome? Yes, I told you this is a hospital. Yes. Ah, ah. If I break my leg next week, I'm going to go to the hospital. Yeah. If I break the other one the next week, I'm going to go back to the hospital again. I'm going to keep going to the hospital and let them patch me up. Amen. But at some point, I'm going to start realizing, you know what? i got to quit breaking these legs. Yeah. Yeah. Am I talking right? Yeah. All right. Okay, help me. I got off course a little bit, but we're going to get back on it. All right, here we go. Amen. We can mean well and still miss the real meaning. All right. Now, Martha did miss it, but it didn't wreck her life. But we can get so driven in the wrong way that we miss out in a huge way and even damage our lives. Samson missed it. He had superhuman power. When I was a kid, I thought of him like this superhero type character. As a kid, his story just was, it just amazed me in the Bible. He had superhuman power. He was incredibly anointed. He had the same vow over his life as uh, Samuel the prophet and John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest of all the prophets. But he missed it. He was driven by his flesh instead of the spirit. And so he missed his destiny. King Saul missed it. He was Israel's first king. He was so blessed. He was so chosen. What if God intended to do through Saul's lineage what he ended up doing through David's? Because he chose Saul first. He chose Saul first instead of David. David was chosen later. Amen? Because Saul messed up. What if Saul hadn't got all big and puffy and proud? What if Saul had to thought that it was all about him and his mind and what he could do? When, they, when God first called him, he was petrified and scared to death. But after he started having some success, he let it go to his head. Listen, you can have all... I, we talked about this in the worship team room this morning. It's your job to work on the talent and the gift God's given you. You got to rehearse. You got to practice. You got you to remember things. You got to do all those things, right? And then once you give that talent to him and that ability to him, then he throws some anointing on it and increases it way past what you could ever do in your own human ability. That's how it works. Right? And so Saul was chosen, couldn't do anything. And once that took place, when he started having success and victories, guess what happened then? He started getting big-headed and thought it was all about him. Be careful about that. we got to watch that. Everybody in here. Be careful how they tell you how good you did that. How good you built that. How good you sung that song. How good you preached that sermon. We have always got to check ourselves. Amen? Me included. Amen? Compliments can go to your head. And all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, yeah. Come on, talk about it. No, I really am. Can I tell you, we can't sing a note without God. We can't hit the right note without God. Come on. We, we can't even breathe without God. We can't preach without God. We can't hold the door open for nobody and reach out and shake a hand and tell them good morning without the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. The rich young ruler missed it. He was asked to join the dream team, y'all. And he was too focused on materialism and wealth. He didn't want to give it up. Judas missed it. He was on the dream team. Right. Walking right next to Jesus. Seeing the miracles 
firsthand. Hearing the words come out of his mouth first. Right there in his presence. But it still won't good enough for him. Be careful when where God leads you to that you start thinking it's not good enough for you. Let that sink in for a minute. Be careful how you tear down what God has put you in. Be careful because all of a sudden you'll say, well, this ain't good enough and that ain't good enough. And listen, if you're the person that somebody has walked away from because they told you you weren't good enough, look, you're in good company. They told Jesus he won't good enough either. Seventy walked away from him in one day. Seventy in one day. Judas was right there with him. And sold him out and betrayed him. Watch how you're feeling about what you've been given. Amen. They were all very headstrong, but not very heart strong. Now, in this last portion of scripture for today, anybody following me this morning? Yes. The Holy Spirit declares profoundly through the Apostle Paul concerning being driven, but missing the main purpose. When we fail to relinquish our headstrong ways, and we don't allow ourselves to be heart strong. We spiritually waste potential. Amen? You waste potential. Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1. We'll show it on the screen. He said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, listen to that, Got all that now. So that I could remove mountains. But have not love. I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned. But have not love. It profits me nothing. You can be called. You can be talented. You can be gifted. But if you are hateful. God wants us to be driven towards our destiny, not driven past it. And if we're driving past it, we've got to ask ourselves, what are we driven by? God's called me to ministry, but I don't like people. What are you going to do here? You got a problem there. He wants us to be driven towards our destiny, not past it. Let me shout one number three. Watch this. You gotta watch how you're doing things. Driven Christians are called to build bridges, not burn them. <laughs> Walk away right. 
We're Christians. Amen. We're not of the world. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. Amen. Hallelujah. Help me, Jesus. All right. Now he says, if you don't have love, you're wasting your time on all these things, right? I'm talking about somebody with the gift of prophecy. I'm talking about somebody who's feeding the poor. I'm talking about somebody who's got all faith. They're moving mountains. I mean, good God, don't go on tour for that. Hold crusades for that. Moving mountains, prophecy, faith. But don't, can that even be possible to be able to do all those things and don't have love in your heart? Holy Spirit, who Paul said it was. Because it gets to be all about them and not about him. And it becomes about, come on, somebody, how much I've learned a term in ministries. Anybody follow with me this morning? Yeah. I mean, some of you looking at me like, come on, Daniel. Look at you call. <laughs> come on, you. When the ministry machine gets to rolling, come on, even if you don't have your act together, God's going to bless and he's going to implement kingdom. So David didn't have his act together, but God was using him. Saul of Tarsus didn't have his act together, but God was using him. Come on, somebody. But that individual that God is using still needs to get their act together. I don't want to do ministry in the name of Jesus Christ and miss my destiny. What can be blocking the love if this happens to somebody? What can be blocking the love? My last shout point. Not showing love is a deficit in spiritual drive. Shout point number four. You'll never be spiritually driven to run right if your spiritual tank contains contaminated fuel. Can I talk about it? I know somebody recently went to a store. I'm not going to say the name. Filled their truck up with what they thought was gas. And they accidentally at the store had put kerosene in the pump. Messed that truck up. Contaminated fuel. Something that was not supposed to be in that tank got in that tank. So guess what happened to the truck? It didn't run right. Guess what happens to you and I? When we get things inside of us that are contaminated, we're not going to run right. We're not going to be led right. We're not going to function right. Come on. You can spend 90 minutes in church, give or take, on Sunday, getting all the right things. But what are you getting when you walk out that door from Sunday all the way to the next Sunday? Especially if you won't come to a Bible study in the middle of the week and get a little bit of midweek for an outpouring. Amen. I think that's a good thing to do for those who do their time for. What do you take in all week long? Are you taking in the Word or are you taking in the world? Are you taking in the things of God or are you taking in the things of this culture that is led by a spirit called Antichrist that will take over this world? He's going to take over the world. And we're going to be snatched out. Right. What are we filling our tanks with, church? That's old school, Daniel. That's old school. No, 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 no. That's still good. We still need to come on. Right is still right. And wrong is still wrong. You'll never be spiritually driven to run right if your spiritual tank contains contaminated fuel. I need to wrap it up. Amen. Watch this. My final note here. Headstrong and driven wrongly keeps people from thinking right, realizing fully and comprehending deeply concerning who they really are. I've been talking about this to my man about the problem all day. People don't know who they are. And when you don't know who you are, you'll believe in counterfeits. You will believe in counterfeits. 
Watch out for counterfeits. Watch out with who you follow. Watch out with what you take in. There's always two sides to a story. If you only follow one side of the story, you could be pulled away from right. and miss what, you, what was meant to be for you. That's right. Ain't nobody going to lead me away from a blessing that I'm supposed to have. That's right. Unless my God is leading me right. away from it. says, I'm going to bless you with something even better than that. Just bypass that. <laughs> but we've got to understand who we are. Finally, distractions cause us to miss important things. <laughs> Distractions nowadays can be deadly. I see crosses on the side of the road where young people have been texting and driving and had a head-on collision and died. In my era, it was don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. And of course, me and my peers, along with, well, along with myself, we drink and we drink. And we got the DUIs, and we got the night in jail, and we got the high insurance for a couple of years to go with it. We got insurance getting jacked up. Broke a lot of people from doing that silly stuff. <laughs> we made it through by the grace of God, thank That's God. Right. But now texting and driving. Oh, help me, Jesus. We're so honed in and focused on our phones, young and old alike. That we take our eyes off the road for the length of a football field to read a text, driving blindly down the road, risking our lives. And distractions can be deadly in the time we're living in. And it can cause you. How how horrible would it be? That's one thing for people to go and drink a bunch of alcohol. I know a lot of people that that that, that drink, but they will not get in a car and drive. They're gonna sit in the house. They're gonna go to. The, they're responsible enough to give somebody their keys. I mean, it was embedded for decades into a culture. Don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. But everybody's got a cell phone. And if they're waiting on that text, a lot of times they cannot wait to read it. How horrible would it be for you to die over a text? Distractions are deadly. You will definitely miss your destiny because it's not for anybody's destiny to die in a car wreck due to a text. To let a cell phone kill you. You can be driven past your destiny. My eyes have wandered too, so I'm not judging nobody out there. We all got to get better about that stuff. But distractions today are deadly. And distractions, especially those phones. Oh, I'm on these phones. I don't even have mine with me. I don't want it to ring while I'm up here preaching. It's in my office. But watch this. Put that phone down when that baby says, Daddy, play with me. That's right. Put that phone down when you've not asked your teenage son in a while, how are you doing, son? How are things going? Put that phone down and wrap your arm around your spouse if you're still blessed to have one Amen. and spend some time with them. And you're going to, because if not, you're going to just, you're going to miss life. Right. Nothing wrong with glancing at Facebook every now and then. Look, we promote the church on Facebook. I preach. We reach people on Facebook. But I am not going to look at it all day. It is not that interesting. Neither is Instagram or anything else. Please. I know I'm stepping on some toes right now. But we are missing out on vital moments. Don't miss out on a moment to get your life together. Don't miss out on the moments to get yourself healthier. Make better choices for your life so you can be here longer. My God, I don't want us to just be in this thing called Christianity. I want to thrive in it. Amen? That's a devil out there that wants to destroy you. Come on, we got to fight. We got to be driven, and we can't be driven past our destinies. Amen? This body's a temple. Let's put some good things in it. Amen? Oh, y'all like it, man. We got to bless God, man. We got to bless Him. Come on, I feel better at 44 than I was at 24. At 24, I was run down and old. I turned 26 on my birthday one time, and a man looked at me and said, you are the oldest looking 26-year-old I have ever seen in my life. Boy, that hurt my feelings. I'm 44 years old. I'm going to be 45 next year. I feel like I can run from King to Santa Claus right now. My God is a good God. He will turn your life around and cause you to make this I used to drink myself silly, drink myself stupid, just contaminate my body 24-7, humiliate myself, and burn out my brain cells. 
but my God is a rewarder. He's a little As I close today, Jesus said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? No matter what you gain, hallelujah. Jesus is the greatest thing you can ever have. We got a Kanye West is going around saying that to everybody. Church wants to shout him down. Shout him down. Oh, does he really mean it? 11,000 Bibles got handed out last week. 1,000 people answered an offer call in one service. Leave Kanye alone. <laughs> he said he realizes that gaining the whole world was not worth him risking losing his own soul. That's the same thing Jesus said. Before Jesus said that, he said, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Because you're not distracted and you're not driving past destiny, they're driving to destiny. You want to know what he said before that? He said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If people are not where they're supposed to be with God, They've not sold out for Jesus Christ. If they've not made a change, even though they answer an altar call, here's what they've not done. They've not denied themselves. They're not taking up a cross. They're not following Him. Do those three things and your life can't help but change. If your life's not changing, if you still got the old mind, the old heart, the old will, you've not done one or all of those three things. Is that too hard to hear? Remember, we got plenty of headstrong Christians. We need more heartstrong Christians. And what we need to pray today is, Lord, don't let me miss it. I don't want to get in my own way. I hope you've enjoyed this series. We've been in it for three months. I hope you'll get driven. I hope you already are driven. If you already are driven for the things of Jesus, get even more driven. If you're not driven at all, get driven. Get driven. Somebody shout, get driven. Yeah. Stand to your feet this morning. If you enjoy what God had to say this morning, give him a hand clap of praise. Yeah.